good afternoon, everyone. Just a few things here at the top. We'll get right to your questions. This morning, Secretary Austin had his first engagement with Admiral Dong Jun, Minister of National Defense of the People's Republic of China via teleconference from here at the Pentagon. The two leaders discussed U.S. PRC defense relations and regional and global security issues. During the discussion, Secretary Austin emphasized the importance of continuing to open lines of military-to-military -military communication between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China. He also underscored the importance of respect for high seas freedom of navigation guaranteed under international law, especially in the South China Sea, and reiterated that the United States will continue to fly, sail, and operate safely and responsibly wherever international law allows. Secretary Austin also discussed Russia's unprovoked war against Ukraine and expressed concerns about recent provocations from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. In addition, the Secretary reiterated that the United States remains committed to our long-standing One China policy, which is guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three U.S.-China joint communiques, and the six assurances, and he reaffirmed the importance of peace and stability across the strait. The Department will continue to engage in active discussions with PRC counterparts about future engagements between defense and military officials at multiple levels, as agreed to by President Biden and PRC President Xi Jinping in November 2023. A full readout of today's call is available on defense.gov. Switching gears, Secretary Austin spoke with Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant last night to discuss the aftermath of Iran's unprecedented April 13 attacks, which, as you know, U.S., Israeli, and partner forces thwarted in a combined defensive operation. During the call, the Secretary reiterated steadfast U.S. support for Israel's defense and reaffirmed the strategic goal of regional stability. As you saw from our call readouts posted yesterday, Secretary Austin continues to communicate with leaders throughout the Middle East region and beyond to emphasize that while the United States does not seek escalation, we will continue to defend Israel and U.S. personnel. Separately, Secretary Austin also spoke with Ukrainian Defense Minister Rustam Umarov earlier today to discuss the situation on the ground and reaffirm our unwavering commitment to Ukraine's defense capabilities and fight for freedom from Russian aggression. A full readout will be posted today on the DOD website. And then finally, looking ahead to tomorrow, Secretary Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General C.Q. Brown Jr. Jr. will provide testimony before the House Appropriations Defense Subcommittee at 10 a.m. on Capitol Hill regarding the fiscal year 2025 DOD budget request. With that, I'd be happy to take your questions. We'll go to AP, Lita. Thanks, Pat. Um, the Secretary's been speaking to uh, Mr. Gallant quite frequently. Um, has he spoken to him again today? Are there plans to do another call today? Uh, he has not spoken with him today, um, and I don't have a call to read out. Of course, we'll, we'll keep you updated. And can you describe in any way <coughs> what the Secretary believes is whether or not the Israelis and Minister Gallant are heeding U.S. entreaties to not trigger a wider conflict in the Middle East? Is there, does, is there a sense that Israel is listening to that message? Um, well, I appreciate the question, Lee. I don't, I don't want to speak for Israel, of course. Um, you know, the, the Secretary has been very clear in his conversations with Minister Gallant per our readouts uh, that we uh, will firmly support Israel's defense. Um, but you've also heard us say that we do not want to see a wider regional conflict. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. Liz. Is it expected that Israel would give the U.S. a heads up if it does a counterattack and give the U.S. Um, any formal warning? Uh, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I can't go into specific uh, diplomatic uh, discussions. Uh, again, we maintain frequent contact uh, not only with our Israeli partners, but our partners throughout the region. Thank you. Fadi. Thank you, General. So according to the readout, and what you just stated, that um, the Secretary reaffirmed the strateg strategic goal of regional stability. Uh, in light of this uh, call, is um, Secretary Austin, uh, more or less uh, hopeful that this goal can be achieved? Um, well, look, I'm not going to uh, characterize uh, the, the Secretary Simon other than to say what, what we've put out there. We've been working very hard uh, for many months to prevent a wider regional conflict in the region, uh, and we'll continue to work toward that end. 
Does the Secretary see uh, a way to achieve this option if Israel decides to strike Iran? Um, well, you know, again, without getting into hypotheticals, um, I guess much will depend on on what happens exactly and how Iran might respond. So, again, as you've heard us say, while we don't seek to escalate, we don't seek escalation in the region, we will continue to support Israel's defense. We will continue to defend our personnel. Uh, and you've also heard us say, as I just mentioned, that we don't want to see this spiral into a wider regional war, nor do we seek conflict with Iran. So again, we'll continue to work toward that. Follow up on this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting that you said this depends on how Iran reacts. Isn't it, doesn't it depend as well on how Israel reacts? I appreciate you call, commenting on my commentary being interesting. Um, but I mean, my words speak for themselves, right? I mean, you're asking if Israel does something, uh, how will the U.S. respond? Well, a lot will depend on what happens. And as you know, right now, nothing has happened. So we'll have to see. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Can you speak generally about how long it takes to set up JLOTs once they arrive? Like typically, what kind of time frame are we looking at? Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of the components are already in the theater. Uh, and as I'm sure you can appreciate, there's sort of a sequencing that will take place to, to construct and implement JLOTs. Um, based on the information that I have right now, we're, we're still on track uh, to have JLOTs achieve operating capability by the end of the month or early May. Uh, and so what you will probably see uh, in the next two to three weeks is components of JLOTs starting to be uh, constructed. Uh, but again, planners are working through those details and we'll certainly provide you much more information as we get closer to. Has the IOC date shifted though? Because originally it was third week of April, then it was end of April, now it's maybe early May. Uh, I'm telling you that um, you know, there's IOC and there's FOC. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're, we're tracking that it will be operational, which means it will have some initial operating capability by the end of the month or early May. Mm -hmm. So it uh, What we said when we announced it was that it would be operational <coughs> within 60 days, and we're still on track for that. Thanks. Chris. Uh, in the Secretary's call um, with the uh, PRC uh, minister today, did he bring up the, the issue of the air intercepts uh, with American aircraft um, and uh, did he uh, press for an explanation of, of why those occurred and what the, the Chinese reasoning was for those. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm really not going to have much more to provide beyond what we included in our readout. As I mentioned, uh, there, there was a discussion uh, about the fact that the United States will continue to fly, sail, and operate safely and responsibly wherever international law allows. Jimmy. Thank you, General. Uh, Iran and uh, uh, Israel. Uh, Iran and North Korea are working together to pursue the performance of nuclear weapons and the ballistic missiles. <coughs> and uh, is it possible that these weapons was used to, to attack Israel? Um, I, I, you know, I can't speculate, Janie. Certainly, um, you know, when it comes to threats posed by uh, the DPRK in Iran, something that we take very seriously, which, which should be obvious. But again, just for the, the sake of restating it, uh, we will continue to work very closely with our partners, both in the Middle East region, as well as in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, to address potential threats uh, to our, our peoples uh, and work very hard towards regional security and stability. And on that front, uh, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region, uh, just to make clear, uh, similar to uh, our uh, ironclad defense of Israel, our relationship and our alliance with the Republic of Korea and Japan are also ironclad, and we will stand beside them uh, to work together towards security and stability throughout the region. Do you, one more. Uh, do you predict that Israel or Iran might use nuclear weapons in the future? Uh, you know, again, I can't get into predicting the future, Janie, other than we're going to work very hard again to, to ensure security and stability and, and uh, prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Warren. Uh, two different questions. <coughs> One, is there any more clarity or information on whether there was or wasn't a 50% 50, 50 failure rate from Iranian ballistic missiles? 
and second in the call between Secretary Austin and Minister Umarov uh, on the unwavering commitment. We're, we're still unclear if Congress is going to pass a supplemental, and it looks like that commitment is very much wavering. What did Secretary Austin tell Minister Umarov on that? And does the Secretary believe the, the supplemental will pass? Yeah. So on the, on the 50 percent number, I don't have anything uh, new for you, Oren, other than to say, uh, as I highlighted yesterday, uh, that uh, the air threats that Iran launched toward Israel, the vast majority of those uh, were taken down. Uh, and clearly, Iran failed to achieve their objective of uh, causing destruction within Israel, you know, very minimal damage on the ground. When it comes to the unwavering commitment of the United States for Israel, um, I, I think it's important, first of all, as you highlight, I'm sorry, so, so many countries to talk about today. Um, the unwavering support of the United States for Ukraine. Um, you know, look, we absolutely need the supplemental, but I think it's also important to look at what the United States is doing uh, with many other countries to support Ukraine. In fact, I mean, we're, we're about to uh, conduct uh, the 21st Ukraine Defense Contact Group. And two years after Russia's invasion, you have a coalition of nearly 50 nations that have worked together for over two years to support Ukraine. And the United States continues to provide a significant leadership role when it comes to working with those partners to ensure Ukraine has the capabilities it needs as well as helping with the capability coalitions that looks at not only the near-term requirements, but also the long-term defense requirements that Ukraine will have. And so we absolutely are committed to Ukraine's defense and we'll continue to work closely with Congress to, to get the resources we need to support them. Tom. Pat, getting back to Jay Law, it's, has the security arrangements been worked out about who will, you know, secure the aid once it gets into Gaza? I, presumably the idea, but any <coughs> other countries we expect to get involved in that as well? And also, as far as who will be driving the aid in, where is it, you know, is that USAID doing that and contracting out? Do we have any details on the way ahead? Yeah, Tom, um, we'll, we'll certainly have much more to provide in the near future. Um, right now, um, you know, what I would tell you is, again, we're making progress on that front. When it comes to security, uh, again, with the, with the important point here that there will be no U.S. forces on the ground in Gaza. Uh, Israel has signed up to provide security. Uh, and so we're obviously working through with USAID who is going to receive that aid, uh, how it's going to be uh, offloaded onto land and then distributed throughout Gaza. So uh, again, I'm not in a position right now to go into much more detail than that other than progress continues to be made. And, and like I said, we're on track right now. Uh, for a late April, early May initial operating capability. Let me go to Carla, and then I'll come to Constantine. You, Pat, um, is CENTCOM Commander General Eric Carrilla still in the region, and is he still working to coordinate a potential uh, defense for any future attacks? Uh, I'd, I'd refer you to CENTCOM on his specific whereabouts. Uh, I, I do know that he's traveling right now uh, overseas, but I'd refer you to them for the specifics. And then on the video call, uh, did Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin mention the surge in sales uh, that you confirmed yesterday uh, that China has been doing uh, supporting Russia's war against Ukraine? Did he mention that at all, and did he ask China to stop? Um, you know, again, as I highlighted uh, in, the, in the topper, um, the Secretary did raise uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, but beyond that, I'm, I'm not going to be able to provide any further details. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Constantine, then I'll come to you, Rob. Thanks. Uh, just a follow quick follow-up on Tom's question. Um, has any decision been made in terms of security being provided at sea? So, you know, Navy ships or other security arrangements for the sea, sea, seaward component of JLOTS? Yeah, so, um, you know, first let me just say that when it comes to JLOTS and when it comes to U.S. forces supporting this effort, it's, it's important to understand that safety of our forces is paramount. So that is something that is being taken into consideration um, throughout this planning process. Uh, and so uh, in addition to uh, some Israeli support when it comes to uh, the, the maritime aspect of security, uh, certainly you know uh, within Sixth Fleet we have capabilities there as well. And uh, as I understand it, the JLOTS uh, uh, vessels and personnel have 
organic um, force protection capability as well. So again, not going to go into the specifics on that, but that is something that, that is fundamental to the entire planning of this operation. Go to Rio and then I'll go to the phone real quick. Um, I have a follow-up on the Secretary's call with the Chinese Defense Minister this morning. And during the call, did the Secretary receive any explanations or any commitment from the Chinese side regarding the recent tensions in the Second Thomas Show in the South China Sea? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I'll, I'll let the, the PRC uh, speak for themselves again. I'd refer you to the readout in terms of, of what was discussed in our positions. Thank you. All right, let me go to the phone here real quick. Uh, JJ from WTOP. General, thank you for the chance to do this. Uh, two quick questions. Israel, it seems, is planning a limited response to Iran's attack. The Pentagon has said it doesn't want a wider war. How do Israel's plans impact the Pentagon's plans in the region? Yeah, again, um, you know, seen those reports uh, and, and certainly would refer you to the Israelis, uh, JJ, when it comes to uh, anything they might do, um, which, of course, is an Israeli decision. Um, you know, as I've highlighted, uh, we do not seek escalation in the region, um, but we will not hesitate to defend Israel and protect our personnel. Um, again, we do not want to see a wider regional war. We don't seek conflict with Iran, but we won't hesitate to take necessary actions to protect our forces. I'm sorry, JJ, I can't hear you. Yeah, Iran and Russia have developed a, a military partnership, which may be to Iran's benefit as, as Israel prepares for whatever response it's going to give. Iran also helps Russia in its war with Ukraine. So how does that partnership impact the Pentagon's view and plans for dealing with both of those countries? Well, you raise a really good point. Uh, and uh, I think it's often forgotten about the fact that Iran has been providing Russia uh, with capabilities to include one-way attack drones, as you know, uh, to uh, conduct its illegal uh, war inside Ukraine. Uh, and so while you see the United States and other international par partners working together uh, to promote regional security and stability uh, and deliver humanitarian assistance, uh, you see countries like Iran uh, exporting terror and destruction. Thank you. Eunice. Thank you, Lord General. You, this administration has been calling for one thing since Saturday, and that, that is the escalation, which sounds like the perfect reasonable thing for hundreds of millions of people in the region. But you're also saying that we're not going to hesitate to defend Israel. So doesn't that give enough freedom to the Netanyahu government to escalate this as much as they'd like? Because the U.S. is going to be there under any circumstances to defend them. Well, again, certainly uh, we don't, you know, the, the bottom line up front, we don't want to see a wider regional war. And we've been working very hard toward that end uh, ever since the, the Hamas-Israel conflict, as you know, kicked off back in October. Um, and when it comes to uh, a potential Israeli response, uh, again, that is a sovereign decision for Israel to make. Uh, they were attacked by Iran in an unprecedented attack, over 300 air threats. Um, so that, that is their decision. Um, but again, we've been very clear uh, that we don't want to see things escalate. Um, what I'm saying is that if Iran were to conduct an attack, another attack against Israel, uh, just to be crystal clear, the United States uh, will support the defense of Israel, just as we did this last weekend. So wouldn't that make a potential Israeli government decision binding for the Pentagon? Again, look, I'm not going to get into the Israeli decision-making. I'd refer you to them. Um, I think we've been very clear uh, that we don't want to see escalation, that we don't want to see a wider regional war. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so China has continued to become more aggressive towards the Philippines. And in the past, MMCA, a U.S. official, stated that we'll continue to press the PRC on those issues. Did Austin uh, press him on this particular issue? Well, I, again, I'd, I'd refer you back to the readout. Um, you know, the secretary, uh, as I highlighted, made clear in the discussion uh, that it is important uh, for the to respect the high seas freedom of navigation that is guaranteed under international law, especially in the South China Sea. Uh, and, and that the United States will continue to fly, sail, and operate safely and responsibly wherever international law allows. 
Correct. But did he press him <coughs> on the uh, Thomas Shoal, like the Philippines, not just the South China? Yeah, Chinese? I appreciate the question. I'd, I'd refer you back to the readout. That's about the extent of what I can provide today. Liz, and then go to the uh, So you've said several times, <coughs> excuse me, that the U.S. does not seek a wider regional war. Is that a message to Iran or a message to Israel? I think it's just a statement of fact. Carla. Thank you, uh, Pat. The IDF is now saying that an Israeli airstrike killed a Hezbollah commander in Lebanon today. Can you confirm, was the secretary given any sort of notification in his call uh, with his Israeli counterpart yesterday? Uh, that's news to me, Carla. I'd, I'd have to refer you to the Israelis to talk about that. Let me go to the phone here. Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. Just two quick questions. Has there been any change to the U.S. military's footprint in Niger? And also, there was a fire at the Army's ammunition plant in Scranton yesterday at the risk of invoking Billy Joel. Do we know who started the fire? Uh, on Niger, Jeff, um, no change in the U.S. force posture at this time. Uh, on the, uh, the fire, uh, I'd have to refer you to the Army because um, we didn't start the fire. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just to clarify and follow up. So is the message that no matter what Israel does, if it reacts, the U.S. will defend it regardless? Well, look, I, th I think the president and the secretary have been clear uh, that the United States uh, and our support for Israel's defense is ironclad. So doesn't that take away any leverage you might have had to try and influence the Israeli decision? Look, uh, Israel lives in a dangerous neighborhood, and again, I think it's important to take a step back here and look at the U.S.-Israel defense relationship, the, the multi-decades-long relationship that we have with Israel, uh, and understand, again, uh, that, that the United States recognizes the neighborhood that Israel lives in, uh, the, the threats to regional security and stability that exist uh, if Israel is not able to defend itself, uh, and so I'll, I'll just leave it there. Doesn't that give them carte blanche then just to go as big as they want? Uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. I, like I said, you know, whether or not Israel responds is, a, is an Israeli decision. We don't want to see a wider regional conflict. You, you see uh, the Department of Defense and the broader U.S. government working hard to de-escalate tensions in the region. You can see that in all the readouts that the Secretary's had with his counterparts uh, throughout the Middle East region. And I'll just leave it there. All right, let me go. Uh, Heather from USNI. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just wanted to check in on what we're seeing right now with the Houthis. It seems like they're getting quieter. Um, do you think that's related to what, what happened over the weekend with Iran, or are we expecting to see more? Um, I, I don't have any updates to provide, Heather, uh, as it relates to the Houthis. Clearly, you know, we, we continue uh, to uh, have forces there that, that work together as part of Prosperity Guardian to uh, deter, uh, disrupt, and degrade Houthi capability, but uh, you know I'd refer you to CENTCOM. They may have more. Uh, and Heather, while I have you on the phone here too, and in, in the in the group, uh, I just want to clarify a question you asked yesterday. Uh, you asked about whether or not uh, air-based or excuse me, land-based, sea-based uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, I don't think you said fighter. I think you just said aircraft um, participated in the taking down of um, or in the action yesterday. What I, what I thought you were asking was, uh, were sea-based aircraft part of the capabilities we had that were supporting this overall effort? That is true. Uh, but just to clarify, the, the fighter aircraft that were um, participating in the operation to take down drones were, were land-based aircraft, not sea-based aircraft. So just to clarify that. All right. Any other questions? Last question. Yes, sir. Uh, just uh, thanks, Pat. I uh, didn't think you had the first time. Um, I put a clarification on the, you said there'd be a Israeli support um, for the maritime aspect of security mm -hmm. on JLOTs. Um, does that include aerial support for those ships, uh, such as monitoring for threats, et cetera? Um, don't want to get into the specifics in terms of air coverage. I mean, clearly the, the United States is going to do what we need to do to protect our forces. Um, you know, as I understand it, Israel has signed up to provide uh, maritime security and land-based security. So I'll just leave it there. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.